you, my brother. Oh, thank you for the privilege and the honor of allowing us to come. And I want to thank your choir, my word. I've said this everywhere I go. I believe in America, it should be perfectly legal to shoot a bad choir. <laughs> you ought to just be able to stand up and put them out of their misery, Pastor. You say, why would you say such a thing? Because a choir can dig a hole that no preacher can get out of. <laughs> Boy, did your choir bless my heart this morning. If that didn't do something for you, number one, be sure you're breathing. Number two, be sure you're saved. That was wonderful. And that lady's trio, my word. Thank you, thank you for the passion and the heart with which you sang. Uh, can I remind you? Singing is an act of worship. And there is nothing worse than singing half-hearted. Because it means you're worshiping God half-hearted. One song will be your last one. And I don't know when it'll be. But I want my last song, Brother John, when I stand before him to say, did you hear it? Yes, that's how much I love you. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Let's thank this choir and this trio one more time. Would you do that with me? God bless you. God bless you. Our ministry right now has always been incredibly busy, but in this hour, we're inundated. And when I tell you that we are now litigating things that I didn't think I'd see in my lifetime, I didn't think my grandchildren would see it in their lifetime. If you can fathom this morning, people are getting sued for going to church. Police officers stand outside and give them tickets and citations. Some are being threatened with incarceration. Businesses are telling people you lose your job if you go to church. And they're firing them. Now, they can go to a pot shop, they can go to a liquor store, they can go to an abortion clinic, but they can't go to church. What has happened in America? Brother Gibbs, what's the hope? Please don't you forget this. I'll say it several times today. The hope is the only hope we've ever had, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the local church. Our hope was never in Washington. Our hope was never in a state capitol. Our hope was never in a man. Our hope was in the person on the cross. That's where our hope is. And this is the most exciting hour to be a Christian that has ever existed in the history of our land. Ever existed. You say, well, Brother Gibbs, are you satisfied with what's happening? Mercy, no. Some heartache things, heartache things, very treasured principles are being violated, but that has nothing to do with our hope. That's right. You want to see God change America, we got to see people get saved. They got to become new creatures in Christ. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 20. The book of Acts, chapter 20. This morning, for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about something super, super critical. Super critical. I want to ask you a question. How's your joy? How's your joy? Do you understand joy is commanded by God? It's not a desirable extra. It's not a good thing just to add now and then. There is no such thing as a good Christian who isn't joyful. Amen. How's your joy? How many of you have children? Hold your hand up, would you? How many of you know kids are God's little spies? How many of you all know that? <laughs> if I could get to your kids before you could get to them, and before you would tell those kids, boy, don't you tell that lawyer nothing, and that'd be good advice. I wonder if the kids would say, you can't believe the joy mom has. You can't believe the joy dad has. You see, joy comes from God. 
The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. How's your joy? Now, the world's watching. Sure and Brother John, the reason I've started preaching on this is I'm finding a real lack of joy among God's people. Well, the COVID is so disturbing and the elections and all the crazy things we're seeing happen. That has nothing to do with your joy. Yes. Nothing. Uh, let me tell you just what we're going to read in Scripture here. The Apostle Paul is going to have a meeting with the elders from Ephesus. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And the elders come down to meet with them. And they say, Paul, whatever you do, don't go there. I know you've had all kinds of bad things. You've had imprisonment and beatings and shipwreck. And Paul, you've had all just kinds of distressful things in your ministry. But don't go to Jerusalem because they're laying in wait to kill you and worse. And Paul says, no, I'm going. And then he tells them this, God has already told me what you're telling me. God says, I'm going to have a very difficult time in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. But then he says this, this doesn't disturb my joy. Mm. My God. What does it take to rock your joy? I don't care which news media you watch, Fox, MSNBC, CBN, it doesn't matter. They're all upset. And they're all mad about something, and they want you mad about what they're mad about. And I've never heard one news outlet say, isn't it fantastic, we have joy. Now listen to this carefully. If you're here and you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, you can't have this joy. This joy of which the apostle speaks comes from God. Yes, sir. But if you're here and you know Christ, how many of you know the Lord as your Savior? Amen. Then this joy is yours. Amen. I was in a federal courtroom, and somehow in the course of that trial, the subject of joy came up. Well, one of the witnesses, a pastor on the stand, the attorneys going after him said, why are you always so joyful? He said, because God gives it to me. Yes. Amen. And the judge called me aside during one of the breaks, and, and he said, David, I want to ask you this question. Do I understand right? Your Christians have a divine resource of joy. I said, say that again, Judge. He said, do you have a divine resource of joy? I said, I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. God gives joy and commands it. You see, if you don't have joy, you're not walking in the spirit. Love joy. Isn't it amazing when our forefathers were in the Roman Empire being slaughtered? Tertullian said, the only thing that the Roman soldiers kept saying is, nothing takes away their joy even when we're killing them. Nothing can stamp out their joy. Wow. Let's read this passage of scripture. Because Paul gives three keys for joy in this passage. Yes, You're going to want to know this passage. Start at verse 17. And from Miletus he, Paul, sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came unto Asia, after what manner I have been with you in all seasons. 
serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. And how I kept nothing back that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now verse 22, And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Mm. Wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is arguably the greatest missionary who ever lived. Right. God, doesn't he deserve a little good path here? He said, no, God says bonds and afflictions. Yep. That's what God has in my path. I wonder how many of us would sign up for bonds and afflictions. Right. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit on Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But in verse 24 comes his key. Oh, yeah. Yeah, here it is. But none of these things move me. Yeah. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with, Joy. what's the next word? Joy. joy. Yes. So that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Three keys for joy. And I want to ask you this question. Do you want joy? Why do you want to live in a spirit of defeat and unhappiness? Now, honestly, I've met some people. I think they kind of enjoy being miserable. Uh, they, they, they've got what I call Eeyore mentality. How many of you know who Eeyore is? Winnie the Pooh's buddy? How you doing, Eeyore? Just fine, but it'll get worse. Good night. Uh, can I remind you, the Bible says you and I have a sworn duty to edify one another. Yes, sir. My duty before God is to edify you. Your duty is to edify me. We're commanded to be builder-uppers. We're to be hope putter inners, not hope sucker outers. You're right. And you can't do that without joy. Amen. Now the world's watching. The world's watching. And you say, well, I have joy, it just doesn't show. You can't hide joy. The first thing it transforms is your face. Don't you ever forget, your face is God's billboard. Everybody reads your face and should. The minute I walked up here, you read my face. I'm reading your faces. Yes, sir. Have you got joy? Real joy. Let's look at the three keys that Paul said. Here's joy number one. He says, none of these things move me. Write this down. You cannot, you cannot be controlled by circumstances. That's good. Now, the world has got this so backwards, and now we've bought the world's perspective. Yes, sir. Right. And the world has confused the word joy with the word happiness. The word happiness comes from the word happenstance. Give me the right circumstances, and I'll be happy. But give me bad circumstances, my happiness evaporates immediately. Oh, oh had a great week. Got a raise. Yeah, oh, everything is so good. Yeah, but what happens when the circumstances aren't good? None of these things move me. Don't confuse joy and happiness. Happiness is governed by circumstances. Joy is from a divine resource. Yes, sir. And circumstances 
cannot take it away. Whoa. Right there. That changes everything. And the world's watching. What does it take to bankrupt our joy? But not our happiness. I wasn't happy over this past election in many respects, but nothing touched my joy. A doctor's visit can be disturbing in circumstance, but that can't take your joy. Joy. When I was eight years of age, my mother contracted polio. I can still vividly remember the morning it happened. She was in the kitchen. It was about five o'clock in the morning. She was making breakfast for the family. And she looked up at me and she said, run, get your dad. I think I'm really sick. And she walked out of the kitchen, went into the living room, fell down on the sofa and never walked again. Polio spinal meningitis had come to our house. She laid on the bed writhing in agony, not able to breathe. Her hands were shaking violently and, and they curled and she just breathed. She just, we immediately called for the doctors in the ambulance and they came and they said she has polio bad. To help her breathe immediately while we're standing there, they, they punched a hole in her throat about the size of a 50 cent piece. I thought, what are you doing to my mom? And I remember them turning to my dad saying, we'll try to get her to the hospital alive, but I don't think she's going to make it. He said, what do you mean? That's, that's my mom. What do you mean she's not going to make it? My mom was the church pianist, conservatory trained. We never missed church. Church was our life. And now she's writhing in uncontrollable agony. And I didn't realize when they took her out the door, I wouldn't see her for two and a half years. For two and a half years, my mother would live in an iron lung, fighting for every breath. I didn't realize those beautiful hands would never touch a keyboard again. Wow. That from the neck down, she would be crippled. Circumstances unimaginable. Wow. We live for phone calls. She's still alive. She's fighting. Several times I remember the doctors saying we, we lost her twice last night. But we revived her. She's fighting. And as a young man, I said, this isn't fair, God. No, no, no. No, I know people never go to church. They don't have none of this. I know people who go to church never serve you. They don't have this. And I remember thinking, God, if this is how you treat your choice servants, what are you doing? Finally, I got to see my mom with my sister. We weren't going to be close. So it was a distance from about here to that keyboard. Looking through glass across a little alley, they, they took her out of her iron lung and brought her up so my sister and I could see her and talk to her for five minutes. That's all the time she could be out of the iron lung. When they brought her up, 
we could hear her on the speaker. She said, turn my head, I want to see my kids. It's been a year and a half, I want to see them. And Brother John, when they moved her head, she screamed in agony. And I got upset all over again. I said, you took her arms, you took her legs, she can't do anything, you could have left her neck. Finally, when we could talk, she looked at me and she didn't say hi, she didn't say hello. You know what she said to me? Don't you think that, David? I mean, you know, moms can read their kids' faces. And I did what every kid did. I lied. I said, don't think what, Mom? She said, son, he's doing all things well. The first words out of her mouth is, this doesn't control me. I can't draw a breath without a machine. But he's doing all things well. And then she looked at me and said, son, don't let this steal your joy. What does it take to squash your joy? My mom, I really believe, could have crushed me for life. But instead, her joy changed me for life. Yeah. I'm afraid we got a lot of kids who say, we go to church and boy, we learn the song when we're kids. I got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. How many of you know that Sunday school song? But now they're teenagers and they're saying, we don't see it in our house. We don't see it in our family. We don't see it in our nation. None of these things move me. None of them. After two and a half years, my mom got to come home. First thing we did when she got home was my dad said, we haven't had devotions for two and a half years. And I want to have devotions. And he read the scriptures. And then we asked for prayer requests. You know what my mom's prayer request was? I want to thank the Lord for everything he's done. And I thank him for his joy. Yeah. I was mystified. When's the last time life put on you and you said, I'm, I'm thanking him for everything? He said, can I remind you, it says, in everything give thanks. Yeah. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Whoa. Now, you'll never do this by accident. This is a decision that I'm not going to abort the joy of God over anything. And then she said, just pray that God gives me something to do. You can't dress yourself. You can't feed yourself. You can't sit up. Half the time, you still got to have help just to breathe. And she said, I, I know the piano's gone. That hurts me. Whenever she'd see a piano player, Miss Kale, she'd weep. She loved it so. But it didn't take her joy. Whoa. Those of you who've heard me tell the story, a pastor came to our church and said, we're going to be starting a Sunday school. Would you like to try to do the Sunday school, Miss Gibbs? And my mom said, I would. 
And over the next seven years, that Sunday school went from no children to where the lady in a wheelchair had 5,000 children there every Sunday. Not 500, 5,000. And you know what all the kids said? That lady in the wheelchair has joy. Would anybody want to be around you? Would anybody want to say, oh boy, what a blessing just to be with you. That's joy. That Sunday school, when my mom went home to be with the Lord, they came and they said, we've got the records. And if I recall right, they said there's 70-some people, men, in the pastorate today who are preaching who got saved in your Sunday school. And 160 or 70 missionaries on the field that got saved in your Sunday school. She never lost her joy. My mom outlived everybody that had polio with her by 25 years. And when we would go to the doctor, an amazing thing happened. Number one, all the doctors and nurses clustered around her. And they all said the same thing. Mrs. Gibbs, you have nothing that works, nothing. Your kidneys, your liver, your, everything has been decimated just terribly. Nothing works. But you never stop smiling. And everybody wants to come and get some of your joy. Could anybody come around you and get joy? And my mom would always say, it's, it's not me producing it, it's God. None of these things move me that I might finish my course with joy. I don't know what you're going to have happen. Maybe everything's great right now. All I know is just one phone call can turn your world upside down. You're right. But nothing can take your joy. Nothing. The first key is you got to get your eyes off of circumstances. Look at the second key. He says, you got to be willing to sacrifice. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Wow. The world's definition of success is completely contrary to the Bible. Jesus said the greatest among you would be the servant of all. I wonder who the greatest Christian in this room is. I can with assurance promise you it's not me. Because I know people in this room that are way better servants than I am. How's your servanthood? You want joy, number one, you got to get your eyes off of circumstances. Number two, you got to start serving. Servanthood is a Bible command. A Bible command. Now, Here's where we mess it up, at least I have. Number one, we want to serve people who can do something for us. Uh, Brother John, I'll, I'll do something for you, but now you owe me. Because I did something for you, right? Don't forget what I did, right? That's not servanthood, that's swapping favors. Jesus said, I want you to go to the widows and the orphans and serve them, the people who can't do anything for you. When's the last time you said, God, give me somebody to serve who can't do anything for me? Because you see, you're not doing it for them, you're doing it for him. Or the other mistake I've made is I want to serve people who at least are nice and say thank you. How many of you know some aggravating people? Hold your hand up, would you? How many of you got some of them in your own family? Hold your hand up, yeah. 
How many of you are sitting next to one right now, right? <laughs> Look at the hands. <laughs> Listen, if I'm going to go out of my way to serve you, I at least want you to be nice. Yep. But what about serving people who aren't nice? Who are not going to say thank you. And you're doing it for the Lord. Remember what Hebrews said? Don't you ever forget this. Jesus went to the cross for sinners. And it says he went with joy. Mark that Bible verse down, would you? Hebrews 12, 2. He went with joy. Yeah. Wow. I grew up on cattle farms. We were in the cattle slaughtering business. My dad and my granddad slaughtered five to 7,000 cattle a week. And we had some large, large feedlots of cattle. And I grew up with cattle in cornfields. And my dad every year would put in five, six, sometimes more thousand acres of corn. And boy, when we put corn in, it was 24-7. Every day but Sunday. Everything was shut down 10 o'clock Saturday night. And at 2 a.m. Monday morning, we were back in the fields. We fought the weather and conditions. Well, my dad came to me one year and he said, you know our Tate's down the road? I said, yeah, I know the Tate's. He said, he's real sick and dying and they don't have anybody to put their crops out. And I want you to go with me. We're going to volunteer to put their crops out. I said, Dad, number one, Mrs. Tate is the devil's cousin. She is the meanest thing on the planet sucking God's air. <laughs> she cusses it all the time. She shoots at our dogs with her shotguns. I, I mean, I've never heard one civil word come out of that. We got all these nice neighbors, great neighbors. They're horrible. Nobody likes the Tates. Why would, and I said, why would we want to do this for them? He said, we're not doing it for them. We're doing it for the Lord. You realize the Bible says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it heartily unto the Lord. He said, they're just the beneficiaries. That's, they're not the people we're doing it for. I, I said, Dad, 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 whoa, whoa. I, I said, we're jammed with what we got to get done. He said, son, don't ever be too busy to serve others. He said, God commands it. Yes. Now, we're going to go see them, and I want you to tell them that we want to do this. And my dad said something to me. He said, if you can't learn to be a servant, you're going to be an awfully unhappy Christian. We went to the Tates, walked up. Here's Mrs. Tate at the door. First words, blankety blank, what do you want, David? And I felt like saying, nothing, just saying hi. And I just walk off. I said, Dad, you hear that? My dad said, tell her while we're here, David. Mrs. Tate, I know your husband's real sick. He's dying. She said, yes, he is. He's only got maybe a month or two to live. And you're not getting your crops out. We want to come help put your crops out. She said, why would you want to do that? And I thought to myself, that is a very good question. <laughs> and my dad said, tell her, tell her, tell her who you're doing it for. 
I said, Mrs. Tate, we're Christians, and our faith commands us to serve them in need. We're doing it for the Lord. She said, are you kidding me? I said, no. She said, well, our machinery's all broken down. It's not been, re my dad said, tell her we'll use ours. It'll be fine. She said, I don't have money for seed or fertilizer or herbicide. My dad says, that's okay. We'll get all that done. Now, David, tell her what a privilege it would be to serve her. And I'm like, do you really believe serving God is a privilege? Oh, come on. Yes, sir. Oh, come on. We live so self-centered, so self-focused. I said, it'll be our privilege, Miss Tate. When we went away, my dad said, I don't think you have but half a minute, David. He said, my prayer is that you become a world-class servant. World-class. Mom, are you raising servants? They got to see it. We went back and told the crew that worked for us what we were going to do, and they said, boy, you, you realize the, the Tates have got like 15, 1,800 more acres. We'll never get them in. And my dad said, no, God will help us do it. Yeah. My dad said, just remember, men, we're doing it for the Lord. We did get it all in. We got it all harvested, and finally we sold their crop, and we got the money. We went to their house, and my dad said, I want you to give her the check and tell her thank you for letting us serve. Now, if you're only going to hear one thing, hear this. In our ministry, I tell our legal missionaries, people thank us, and it's backwards. Thank you for letting us serve. Yes. The privilege is in the hand of the servant. Oh, that's good. Yes, sir. He said, I want you to thank her for the privilege. We walked up and I said, Here, here's the check. We got you a great price. And then I paused and my dad said, you, you have one more thing, David, don't you? I said, Miss Tate, thank you for letting me serve you. Thank you. Has the world ever seen you as the servant of all? My wife has helped me with this. She'll make a list and she'll say, let's just find some people that, that we can help, that we can serve, that nobody even knows about. You want joy? Number one, you got to get your eyes off of servant, your eyes off of circumstances, and number two, you got to get your eyes on serving. Amen. That's what Paul said. Mrs. Tate said, "I don't know what to say," but she said, "My husband and I were talking, and he's awfully sick. I wonder, could we, could we one time go to church with you guys?" She said, "We never go. We don't even go Christmas, Easter. We don't." We just don't know what to make of you folks. This world does not know what to do with servants. Wow. Mr. Tate lived a little longer than they thought. He lived another six months. In that time, both she and he and both of their kids got saved. But the greatest lesson was what my dad taught me. Serving. Yes. Serving. Yes. Number one, your eyes are off of circumstances. Number two, you're willing to serve. Write number three down if you want joy. 
And he says it right here, that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I've received of the Lord to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Yes. You've got to be willing to testify. Amen. I hope this isn't you, but we've got so many Christians sitting in the bleachers when it comes to sharing the gospel. In our lawsuits, we find this all the time. We find that in good churches, less than 20% of the people ever testify, ever reach in their pocket and, and hand out a gospel track, ever tell anybody about Jesus. And we've never had better tracks, we've never had better tools, and we've never used them less. And by the way, it doesn't matter where we go in America. America's flooded with people who aren't saved. And you know what we find? Less than 6% of the people in our churches are faithful at it. That means 94% of the people who believe in witnessing, who want to see people saved, they just don't do anything about it. You want joy? You got to get your eyes off of circumstances you got to start serving, and you got to finish the witness. Can I remind you the Great Commission wasn't just for pastors and missionaries. It was for every child of God. Go ye into all the world. Pastor Mark Smith is a pastor in Tacoma, Washington. They're from Florida, the state city of Jacksonville, and his mom is dying from very advanced cancer. She's bed bound and she tells her son, I, I know just in a short time I'm gonna be with the Lord, but she said, I, I wanna finish witnessing. She said, could you just get me the least expensive local phone there is? I don't wanna make long distance calls, just local calls. And would you get me a phone book? And he said, mom, we can do that, but why? She said, I want to start calling people out of the phone book and witnessing to them. And he said, I told her, Mom, I, I, I don't think too many people would be willing to listen to that. She said, God will help me. Well, she got that phone and just started picking names. And you know what she'd do? She'd call people and she'd say, you don't know me and I don't know you. And I'm dying. And I asked my son to get me this phone just so I could share with you what has changed my whole life. And she would witness over the phone. Amazing, 90 plus percent of the people talked to her because the spirit with which she started witnessing. And she said, I wouldn't blame you for hanging up on me, but please don't. I want to share with you what Jesus has done in my life. Before that lady went home to heaven, she personally had the privilege to lead right up tight to 300 people to Jesus Christ, half of whom their church followed up on and came forward and made a public profession and were baptized. I can't do anything. I can't get out of this bed. I'm dying, but I can witness. How about you? What are you doing? Well, Brother Gibbs, I'm awfully busy. We all are. But you want joy? You got to get your eyes off of circumstances. You want joy? Oh, you got to start serving. Yes, sir. And number three, you got to be faithful in your witness. Paul said, I'm going to finish my course with joy. The Bible says it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. Do you have it? Do I? Don't leave here without it. It's yours. You have a divine resource. Yes. If you're a child of God, God wants you to know and have this joy and spread this joy. My mom, when she went home to be with the Lord, 
My dad took a picture. She died with the biggest smile on her face you ever saw. Oh, pain. But it didn't control her joy. And her last prayer for me was, don't let anything take your joy, David. Amen. Joy unspeakable. Yes. Bow your heads in prayer. Father, oh my, this world needs to see some joy. They need to see what Jesus does in a life, in a heart. Heads are bowed. How many of you say, David, God spoke to my heart. I want that joy. I need that joy. My heart's been touched this morning. If that's true, hold your hand up right now. Hold your hand high. Do you have your hand up? I want you to get up out of your seat and make your way to this altar. We're going to pray. No one gets this by accident. This service is going to be over in mere moments. But the joy changes everything. What can we do for America? Show them joy. Not governed by circumstances. A joy that above everything is based on servanthood. And a joy from God as we witness for the cause of Christ. Father, I bow with these people. If there was ever a time our nation needed to see Christians with joy, it's right now. So many are distressed, disappointed. How could the things have happened that we're going through? None of that controls our joy, none of it. Our joy is from you, and that's why Paul said, I'm gonna finish my course with joy. Hear the cry of every heart, Father. Father, the first people that need to see joy in me is my own family my friends, the people I minister with, the world, our neighbors. We have divine resource, joy. Help us to get our eyes off of circumstances. And God, don't let us confuse happiness with joy. And God, we want to be your servants. Give us people to serve for you. Father, by your grace, by your grace, may we be a faithful witness and tell others about what Jesus can do for all eternity. Hear our cry in Jesus' name, I pray. And all God's children together said, Amen.